carefully. Father, bless your word. Let's go to Exodus 25 again. If I could get somebody to get me a couple glasses of water, I'd sure appreciate it. I'm already dry. I hadn't even started. Exodus 25. We spent all Wednesday on verse 18 to 22. We're going to pick up there. And I'm going to ask a question today. This is about our sixth message now on the cherubim of glory. Why do we have an enemy? Why is there a devil? Why is he allowed to do what he does? And what can we do about it? Anybody interested? How many know that if you ever got a problem, first thing you need to do is find out what the cause is? Because if you don't know the cause, you're never going to be able to remove it. See, for every effect, there's a cause. If you don't like the effect, you've got to change the cause. If you don't do anything about the effect, then the cause will stay. Now, Yeshua came with a specific purpose. The Word says that Yeshua came to destroy the works of the devil. Right or wrong? That's why He came. Why is He in your life? To destroy the works of the devil. Do we have the works of the devil in our life? Most of the time. I'm sure that when redemption takes place and we're all lifted into the Spirit, all of a sudden it's going to dawn on me I was a lot more carnal than I thought I was. A lot of people who think they're spiritual are not spiritual at all. See, because spirituality isn't what I think. Spirituality is my response to the Holy Spirit. Now, everybody at some point can respond to the Holy Spirit. We live by grace alone. A thing you can do on your own. You live totally 100% by grace. But grace will teach you to deny ungodliness. There's a war. And that war is between our ears. That spirit realm wants dominion in my life. Father Yahweh wants dominion in my life. Satan wants dominion in my life through my flesh. He has no right over me. He has no right to me unless I give him an open door. How many times have I said, if a mailman stands at your front door with a time bomb, says, here, would you take this, please? And you say, well, I, I don't know how to say no. See, some of us have never been taught how to say no. We just, Yeah, whatever you have to give me, I'll take it, even if I don't want it. Some of us, I think, learned that when as little boys and little girls, we sat at our dinner table and Mama said, you're going to eat this asparagus. And every one of us said, oh, yuck, patooey. And we got whipped for it. We, we were learned to eat what we don't like. And then at some point, we just said, I ain't going to fight it anymore. And we'll just eat whatever anybody gives us. And as we grow up, we develop that attitude in our spirit, man. Whatever the devil gives us, I guess it's okay. I don't like, I don't like it. I'll gripe about it, but it's okay. <laughs> Somewhere we've missed it. We need to fight the works of the devil in our life. Yeshua, in John 10.10, set the course. The thief comes to do what? How's he going to steal something if you don't have it? He can only steal what you got. He can't steal what you don't have, right? If you don't have any jewels in your house, the thief cannot, cannot steal any jewels. I mean, he may get into your house. But he's not going to steal anything because there's nothing there to steal. Now, some of you think, I haven't got anything for the devil to steal. <laughs> You're wrong. He's got a whole bunch of things to steal from you. You're right to live right. You're right to think right. You're right to be happy. You're right to be well. You're right to please Father. You have a right to that. He wants to steal that from you. He is a destroyer. He's going to destroy everything you love, everything you want. Why? Why is it that it happens and I'm a Christian? There's somebody out there that seems to be, in spite of my salvation, in spite of my prayers, things are going wrong. Why? There's an enemy. Well, what gives him the right to do what I don't even give him the right to do? That's what I tell myself. Is it true? Well, we're going to find out. Exodus 25, verse 18. You shall make two cherubim of gold. A beaten work shall you make them. How are cherubim made? They're beaten. Can't make cherubim without being beaten. Now, before we go any further, let's analyze something. I want to give you something else here, too. This is the tabernacle when it's finished. Here's the glory cloud coming out of the top of the tent. And inside of this tent, there's two rooms, right? Holy place, holy of holies, and a veil in between. When everything was right, the glory would descend. That's the Shekinah blessings and presence of the Holy Spirit in our life through the sacrifice of the blood atonement of Christ. And only one man could walk into that Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest. He had to wear a certain hat. He had to wear a breastplate with 12 stones, 12 tribes 
engraved upon those twelve stones. He had to wear certain articles of clothing, and there was no way in the world he was allowed to be in that Holy of Holies without certain dress. Now, you and I, we think, well, I'm saved. Called sloppy agape, I can do whatever I want now that I'm saved. Father says that you're going to have to learn to put on a certain clothing. If you're going to be a priest, you've got to wear a priest's garment. How many know that your garments are spiritual clothing? We're not, so, You know, you can be barefooted and have dirt on your pants and still have access into the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies is not kept out by work clothes. You have clothing that Father has given to you that can be put on only by the thinking apparatus of your mind. You and I have no access to that Holy of Holies without a proper approach. Come boldly to the throne of grace. You know what it says? Only one place you and I can come, folks, when you pray. If you, if, in other words, you, it's just not a matter of you saying, uh, whoever you are up there, I have a prayer request, and uh, would you do this for me, please? And uh, the church says, say in Jesus' name, amen. That's the way most people pray. And then they wonder why it doesn't happen. That's not prayer, folks. We know not how to pray as we ought. We spend a lot of time on proper prayer. We only go through the sacrificial death of Christ. Only what He's earned for you, only what He's merited for you, is going to be given to you. Your faith reaches into His atonement and pulls it out. And it's called the throne of grace. Grace through what Christ has done. Here we get a picture of it. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Of beaten work shall you make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. They're to be one with the mercy seat, and they're part of the mercy seat. Now, here's the Ark of the Covenant. There's the Ark. Notice there's no mercy seat on it. There's no cherubim on it, just an empty box. Gold on the inside, gold on the outside, and acacia wood in between. Three articles were placed in it. A pot of manna, two unbroken tablets of stone, which contained the Ten Commandments written by the finger of Yahweh. How many know that in the... Uh, what was that movie, Indiana Jones? First movie he made. Remember, they went looking for the they went looking for the ark, and they found it among the government archives. <laughs> what an imagination! But anyway, when they opened up the ark, it had two broken tablets in it. In the movie, and it shows that these movie writers don't read their Bible. You you weren't allowed to have unbroken tablets in the ark. How many knew that the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah? comes from a two Greek words, deuteros and nomos, meaning second law. Five books of the Torah, fifth book means second law or second chance. Do you believe in a second chance? I sure do, because the first chance I blew it. It's called grace. Only this time he wasn't allowed. He says, now before you look at what the people do, I want you to get those two stones that I wrote the commandments on the second time. Only this time I want them in the ark before you can, before you can do anything with them. Now, first time, remember, he got so mad that he threw them on the ground and they broke, right? which typified that we as earth people break his law, divine law. So Father had to give him another set of tablets, and they were written on stone. One, commandments towards Yahweh, and the second set towards man. So you have the cross. You have that which is between you and Father straight up. You have that one which relates to you and your fellow man sideways. So the commandments typify the cross. And Yeshua paid the price for the broken commandments. He was the ark, and His law was written in His heart. And you'll find this in Hebrews 10. How many know the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews? Right or wrong? Only a Hebrew understands because a Hebrew was a temple consciousness believer. That's what a Hebrew was. Many people say, well, I'm a Hebrew. Well... What do, you, what do you know about the temple? I don't know anything. <laughs> You're a mockery. They may not understand all of it, but they're connected with the temple. In the days of Yeshua, everybody, they had to go to the temple. Three times a year, you had to attend the feast at the temple. Every priest at some point had to go to the temple and officiate, even if it was for only a week out of the year. Everybody had to do their share in the temple. They were a temple consciousness people. Father never did anything without the temple. The most important part of the temple was the Holy of Holies on, from Moses until Yeshua. No one was allowed in the Holy of Holies before that mercy seat called the throne of grace. And just put this in your memory bank, that the altar of, or throne of grace and altar of mercy seats, one and the same thing. 
It's what comes on top of that because Father looks down and he sees unbroken law. Christ was our ark. He tabernacled among us. He said, I came to do whatever Father told me to do. I have come to do thy will. That's what it was. I came to do thy will. Anytime you don't do his will, what is sin? Transgression of his will. His will and his law are one and the same thing. Now, when it comes to prayer, what does it say about prayer? If you ask anything according to his will, what is his will? His law. He said, I don't know what his will is. Yes, you do. It's in his law. He tells you how to relate to Him, and He tells you how to relate to one another. But we all have a problem. I have trouble relating to Father at times, and I have trouble relating to you at times. And you have trouble relating to me at times, and that's called flesh. Just because we have the problem doesn't do away with the law. And the law has, just like natural law has, if you break the law, there's a penalty, especially if you get caught by the policeman. If you can get away with it for a while, that's cool. You can break the speed limit thousand times over, but one day you get caught. You may not have to pay for those thousand times, but the one time you are caught, you will pay according to whatever. That's natural law, but you'll never get away with breaking divine law. Every human being is accountable to divine law. Now, when it says we're not under law, it means that if we were under law, it only takes one sin to damn you. That's all it takes, one. And the whole purpose of Israel in the Old Testament with the blood covenants was to say that whenever there's sin, there has to be a blood covering. Find a lamb, find a goat, find a pigeon, find something. It must take the place of your life. Life for life. Mandatory by law. I'm glad I'm not under law. Because law says, I will pay the price, and the price for sin is what? Death. Anybody here want to die for what you did today? (laughs) Just once. In Christ, He paid the debt for all of us. And now in grace, we can go in spite of our failures and receive cleansing. There is nothing I cannot be cleansed from in my life. Now, once I get cleansed, what about my weakness? I wish it's so hard to preach on a true biblical understanding of law and grace, but once you get it, it's the simplest thing you ever saw. See, I cannot, by my effort, achieve anything before Father. I kept all the Ten Commandments perfect, never missed a Sabbath, and was circumcised. I'd still go to hell. Why do them? Father gave them his types and shadows, that's all. To teach a spiritual law of reality that must be in our life that can only come through the Spirit. Romans 7, 14, the law is spiritual. What it is, it's not, not biological. You can't make this flesh obey. How many know you can tell this flesh, don't desire? <laughs> moment it sees something, it's going to desire. It's just there, folks. We think that salvation is getting rid of desire. Oh, boy, I don't have any more desires anymore. One, no more temptation. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. I'm just going to walk through life 24 hours a day. Just want nothing but what Yeshua wants. How many have found that true? I haven't. I find I wrestle with the old man. I crucify him. I put him under. I bury him. That sucker keeps resurrecting more than the resurrection gets. I need some grace. Not so much to deal with Father, but to deal with me. And to deal with you. <laughs> we, we just need grace one for another, see? Well, that's what that was going to teach up there. All these things in the tabernacle pertain to Christ, but if you are in the body of Christ, then it pertains to you, okay? Now, this was the ark. All it had was three articles of furniture, manna, commandments, Aaron's rod that budded without any roots. Supernatural power of the resurrection. All typified through Christ. Here's an example of the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with a mercy seat, solid gold, with cherubim of glory and their wings overshadowing the Ark. That's what's in Exodus 25, verse 18. Here's another picture of it. Many different people have different pictures. I don't think anybody can... uh, I haven't found a picture yet that agrees with what I saw in my spirit. But they're all human attempts to try to remodify or bring back out a proper image. Now, a minute ago, I showed uh, this one here, which was the ark. This is the bottom side. Well, here's the the top side. It's laying down on its side. You can see it wants to show you a side view. Here's the bottom portion of the mercy seat that would go right onto this bottom portion right here. It would lay right on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and then it would stand upright. And these were the, you can see the faces looking 
They're towards each other, but they're looking down so that when the blood was upon the mercy seat, Father Yahweh could take that glory and descend and bless the children of Israel. And these were the wings that overshadowed the mercy seat. Here's, an, here's another picture of the dual aspect of the Ark of the Covenant. Here again, you can see very clearly, you have the Ark, you have the mercy seat, and you have the cherubim, and you have the three articles of furniture that go inside of the Ark with the staves that the high priest could carry. That was the most holy of all the furniture in the Ark of the Covenant. And Father never moved in Israel. Never was there a miracle. Never was there military victory. Never was there prosperity in the land. But it came right out of that room right there. It came right off that ark. Nothing. Most Bible scholars, particularly Baptist Bible scholars, have probably written more books on the tabernacle than any other single denomination on the face of this earth. And they've done some fantastic work. They've done probably the best work of relating everything in the tabernacle to Christ. But they've left a couple things out, and that is the fact that he's the head and we're the body. Therefore, what is typical of him is also typical of you. Father Yahweh sat, as we mentioned Wednesday night, upon the mercy seat between the cherub, but we found out in the Hebrew it was in the cherub. His glory radiated from off of the cherubic figures that were here. Now, we went back to the book of Genesis. We found out that they put Adam out of the garden. That the Garden of Eden was the Holy of Holies. There was a temple site. How many remember Adam and Eve? I mean, uh, Cain and Abel. They were both told to bring their sacrifices. Remember that? One brought the lamb. Who told him to bring a lamb? Offered a blood, blood sacrifice. Abel come bringing up his works. Fruit of his labor of the earth. And he said that a... Remember it says, sin lieth at the door. The Hebrew is a sin offering lieth at the door. In other words, Father had provided a lamb for Cain. He rejected the lamb. He was actually going to come before the tabernacle that was in the garden without blood. You don't do that, folks. You don't do that. You're not going to be received by anything you produce. Even after saved, you haven't got anything to give Father that is going to be worth anything. Now get that in your mind. You're saved by grace. You don't have anything that's, that's worthy of salvation. And after you get saved, you also have nothing you can bring him. It's all through the blood. But there are works involved that have nothing to do with salvation. We need to understand this. I said a couple weeks ago, give you the story of a little baby as it's being born. How many know today that there are a number of examples of children being born? They're born dead, right? Stillbirth. They're dead. They just, nothing's there. I mean, you got the child. You got all the parts. There's no life. They die. But when a child is born and the mother picks up that child and the hands are moving and the feet is moving and it's, and it's got life in it and the life that's in that baby, it's moving. It doesn't know what it's doing, but it's doing whatever it has to do. It's going to give expression to the life that's in it. And the mother would say, it works. It works. Whenever you see a baby that's moving, it's working. Any of you that know anything about mechanics know there's times when your car doesn't work. Sometimes just plain out of gas. Sometimes it needs a spark plug. Sometimes it needs an overhaul, these various things. And all of a sudden, oh, I'm so glad it's working again. Now, are you trying to tell me that it's trying to earn something? Of course not. We are use the word, and the word work is also used in the Bible in the same sense. Works is the evidence that I've been born again, not that I have to earn my way to get there. Spiritual law and the spiritual will is evidence that I'm yielded to His Spirit and to His will when that same will is reinforced through me. He said, I will no longer write my law upon stony hearts, but I will write it upon your flesh or upon the hearts of flesh and not upon hearts of stone. Here He wrote it on stone, hard rock, no life to it. But he wants a law that has life. He doesn't want people to say, I can't commit adultery, but I'd sure like to. Got a lot of that in the world. If we said to everybody, okay, there's no more law. Do what you will. Just, just, just plain lift that. Don't tell this to the sinner. Just preach it in the churches. Tell this to the Christians, okay? Tell it to the weak Christians. Tell it to the Christians that, that, uh, that have flesh problems. Say, you know what? I just found out from heaven. That we're all under grace, there's no more law, so do what you will. What do you think is the first thing they're going to do? Whatever they feel like. If the desire's there, give in to it. I mean, we already have a horrible thing in the church world today, and that is that 50% of the young people in the churches throughout the land are living in fornication. We've got a serious problem. 
Why? Because we've told them they're saved by grace, not by works. There's danger, folks, on both ends. We need balance. You're only saved by grace, and that's perpetual. But works is the sign that you're linked up to Him because it is by His Spirit only that I can... Not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit. I need that daily inflow of His Holy Spirit writing His law upon my heart that I might not sin against Him. When Joseph was 17 years of age and he was tempted by the wife of Pharaoh, she was a beautiful woman. She took off all of her clothes and she says, Come here, Joseph. You're a young boy. You're good looking. You're handsome. and I'm going to go to bed with you. He went running out of that apartment as fast as he could go. I think he was a normal 17-year-old boy myself. But he ran. Why? He said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against Yahweh? He had an attitude that said, I can't do it. How many know that, that in any home you've got to have certain laws just to keep peace in the home? I mean, nobody can go do their own thing all the time without creating chaos. We've already got that in America, and you can see where it's leading this land. Homosexuals have the right to live their lifestyle flauntingly in front of you and in front of little kids. It doesn't bother them at all to teach a four-year-old boy how to practice homosexuality. They're not even ready or prime or ripe. And that's cool. That's legal in this land today, but you can't pray on the street corners. That's illegal. Our laws are twisted. They're, they're mixed up. They're, they're raw. Because we've been told that we have a right to do what we want to do. When you are saved, you are saved from rebellion. You are saved from sin. That's what you're to be saved from. Sin. But no one is saved from sin overnight because there's still a natural tendency to sin. So how do I get saved? I hope I got some of you thoroughly confused. Get your brains filled with the Holy Ghost so you can think your way through. There has to be a mercy seat that comes down over this ark to cover the law from this side that's been broken. Father can only look upon perfect law. You shall make two cherubim of gold of beaten work. Shall you make them at the two ends of the mercy seat? Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end of one piece with the mercy seat. Shall you make the cherubim on the two ends of it? The cherubim shall spread out their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. With their faces to one another towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. And there I will meet with you and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Now this, the Bible takes it for granted that everybody knows what a cherubim is. You'll find the cherubim in Genesis. You'll find them in Exodus. You'll find them in Leviticus. You'll find them in Numbers. You'll find them in Deuteronomy. You'll find them throughout the Psalms. You'll find them out throughout all of the histories. The cherubim are a profound group. Let's go back to Genesis, pick up a verse real fast. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubim. And the flame of a sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The cherubim were designed to keep the way of the tree of life. That's, that's their purpose. First man was put out of the garden and kept out by the cherubim. That was their task. That was their job. As the Israelite priest would come into the tabernacle upon that veil every single day, they had to attend to the altar of incense where there was prayer in the morning and in the afternoon. There they would attend to the candlesticks, and there they would attend to the loaves of bread. Every day they would look at that veil. Veil, Exodus chapter 26, verse 1, was composed of white linen, inbred with blue, red, and, or scarlet, and purple. Cherubim, the entire veil was cherubic in four colors. The priest would see there was no way to get into that Holy of Holies, into the throne of grace. No way to approach a holy Elohim. No way to get a hold of the Almighty. There was no way. And they'd see that every day. And they'd have to watch what they did or they'd be struck dead. 
And they kept seeing that veil. Can't get in! Can't get in! Can't get in! Adam couldn't get back into the garden. Priests couldn't get into the Holy of Holies. Only once a year the high priest could walk in. Two thousand years stayed the same. Yeshua comes on the scene, dies on a cross, and immediately that veil is rent, that veil of cherubim. Rent in twain, and now a way was open where every believer can approach through the blood of the Lamb. No cherubim can keep you out. What took place? Let's go to Ezekiel 1 again. Verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north. Now, the garden was east of Eden, right? All right? Now, remember, there were certain tribes that were to be on the east side. Certain tribes were to be on the north side. Certain tribes were to be on the west side. I wonder what tribes are in the west today. And I looked, and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud. And it's not a cumulus cloud. This was the cloud of His glory that rested upon the mercy seat. With a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness all around it, and out of the middle of it, as it were glowing metal, out of the middle of the fire, and out of the middle of it came the likeness of four living creatures. Well, what was the name of those creatures? What is it in, in uh, Zoe? Beings in whom is the fullness of divine life. And everyone, and out of the middle of it came the likeness of four living creatures, or four Zoe, as the Septuagint says. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, looked just like a human being. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Now... We've been on this chart now for three weeks. Some of you should have it memorized. We were on it several years ago as well. They had four faces. You find that in verse 10. But before we get it, let's look at the whole cherubic picture. Their feet were straight feet. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. They sparkled like burnished copper. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and the four of them had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man. They four of them had the face of a lion on the right side. The four of them had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four of them also had the face of an eagle. Their faces and their wings were separate above. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Where the Spirit was to go, they went. Now, that is exactly what a cherubim life is all about. Wherever the Spirit goes, that's where they go. They don't know how to operate apart from the Spirit. You want to be full of life? You operate in the Spirit. It's one thing to have life. It's another thing to be full of life. You know, you can walk into a grocery store and it's full of food and you're starving. Maybe you don't have enough money. Maybe you're living on the streets. You see all that food, and it's tempting to just take it off. The difference is, is that you're in the midst of plenty and can't get a hold of any. That's where a lot of Christians are. We've got the life of Christ, but we're still empty inside. We're void. There has to be a fullness. This is Father's picture of where He wants you and I to be. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be victorious. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to fulfill His will and His law. That is His will for your life. And you are defeated simply by being defeated. It's not the Father's will. Why is it happening? That's what we're going to talk about today. We have the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Four faces of the cherubim. We have how many Gospels? Four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Even the early church told you that Matthew was the lion. Gospel. That is, that he was the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's the life of Christ expressed in his authority, kingly authority. Mark is the life of Christ expressed by the suffering servant in the form of an ox. Luke is the gospel of the life of Christ as the second man, Adam, who came in the white linen, perfect righteousness. The eagle, Christ is the life of Christ, rather, in John Expressed by the blue of the heavenlies where the eagle lives and flies, and lives in truth. You have a fourfold description of Christ in the body of Christ and how we're to line up if we're overcomers. Verse 12, And they went every one straight forward. Where the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, 
Their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches. Oh, hallelujah. How would you like to have somebody say to you, man, he's a burning flame. There is no greater testimony to the life of Christ than that you're burning with the Spirit. Now, if you don't get around the fire, folks, you're not going to catch the flame. The fire went up and down among the living creatures. It's got to go up. It's got to go down. It's got to go up. It's got to go down. I mean, this thing's got to burn inside of you. They're Holy Ghost filled people. And the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. Where did the lightning come from? It came out of the fire, didn't it? And the fire was in the living creatures. And you find this in the book of Revelation. When you find the word lightning, find the word fire, you're going to find the overcomers. And the living creature ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth beside the living creature, for each of the four faces of it. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like a burl, and the four of them had one likeness. Their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel within a wheel. How many have ever seen a gyroscope? You ever seen that little round circle that's got four little runners on it, and when you spin it, it'll go in whatever direction it finally takes off on, right? Well, the Spirit's in the wheel. Wheel is a circle. The cycles of the Spirit, the movement of the Spirit, the laws of the Spirit. And when the Father gets those wheels moving, there's a face for every We say, well, I'm having the hardest time showing the face of a lion. That's because you never got attached to the wheel. How many know that i got to go to San Francisco? It's awful long walk. Well, can I suggest you get in, take your wheels with you and get in the car and go? Let the wheel carry you. See, if you try to be a lion while you're a pussycat, it ain't going to work, folks. You've got to get in the wheel and let it take you there. It's in the wheel. I haven't got time today to preach on the wheels. Very unusual message today. Bear with me. Verse 17, when they went, they went in their four directions. They turned not when they went. As for their rims, they were high and dreadful, and the four of them had the rims full of eyes. There's those eyes again. Remember, Revelation 4, they were full of eyes. Saw where they were going, saw where they had been. And understood and received all things, having the eyes of your understanding enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your call. If you do not know who you are, what you're to do, what your calling is, what Father wants in you, you're blind. And you know what? He came to heal what? Blind eyes. Where are your eyes? It's in your understanding. What is the understanding? It's the veil. You've got to have the veil ripped. That's the understanding of your carnal mind when it comes to your life. You've got to get rid of it, folks, and it only happens when the resurrection life of Christ comes to bear upon your life. And that, again, is a work of grace. Verse 19, when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. When the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the Spirit was to go, they went. There was the Spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up beside them, for the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Or the wheels were in the Spirit. These things are in your spirit. But when you're born again, do you realize that you had an automobile put inside of you? A divine vehicle put inside of you? A vehicle to carry you wherever you're supposed to go? It's in the DNA code of your spirit. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up beside them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And over the head of the living creature, there was the likeness of a firmament. Now get this. Over the head of the living creatures, the Zoe, there was a likeness of a firmament. Like the terrible crystal to look upon, stretch forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one towards the other. And every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a noise of... The... Now, now, let that sink in, folks. What did their wings sound like? Sound like a noise, sound like a voice, sound like waters. Now, living water flowing out of you. The Word flowing out of your spirit, man, being spoken through your lips, are the wings. You want to get lifted above your earthly trials and problems? You've got to learn how to speak spiritual truth to your physical being. Bring your physical nature under the control of spiritual law that's in Christ. Romans 8, 2. For the law, what's it say? For the spirit of the life that's in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 25. There was a voice above the firmament that was over their heads. When they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their head, now here comes the good part, was the likeness of a throne. Oh, hallelujah. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. That's blue in color. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man upon it above. And I saw, as it were, glowing metal as the appearance of fire within it all around. From the appearance of his loins upward and from the appearance of his loins downward, 
I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Now, what's this whole vision about? The glory of Yahweh. Paul, writing in Hebrew, says in chapter 9, the cherubim of glory, of which things we cannot yet at this time specifically explain to you. They were called cherubim of glory. He saw the glory. Ezekiel was a priest within the Israel nation, and he was in captivity. And while he was in that captivity, he was lifted up and beheld a vision of the throne, the Holy of Holies, Yahweh upon it, and the work of the cherubim. And it was a marvelous vision. But nowhere in this chapter are they called cherubim, and they are supporting the throne upon which the Son of Man is sitting. And this throne is called the throne of grace. Come boldly unto the throne of grace, which is also called the mercy seat in Exodus 25. Now let's go into the 10th chapter of Ezekiel. Now notice that almost half of the Exodus 25 is cherubim. All of Ezekiel 1 is cherubim. All of Revelation 4 and 5 is cherubim. All of Ezekiel 10 is cherubim. And somebody says, I didn't know cherubim was in the Bible. Chapter 10, we don't have time to read it all, but let's begin it. Verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was over the head of the cherubim, there appeared above them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Now, this verse picks up where the other one left off. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Go in between the whirling wheels, even under the cherub, and fill both your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. Well, I wish I had time to preach on this. Verse 4, the glory of Yahweh mounted up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with a cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Yahweh's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even to the outer court as the voice of El Shaddai when he speaks. Isn't that heavy? Mm. Now let's go down to uh, verse 10. And as for their appearance, the four of them had one likeness as if a wheel had been within a wheel. Verse 14, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of the cherub, the second face the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and fourth the face of an eagle. And the cherubim mounted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Kibar, which means that these cherubim in, Revel, in Ezekiel 10 were the same group as he saw as the zoe or the living ones in Ezekiel 1. They're cherubim. Cherubim is a Hebrew word, cherubim, meaning guardians of the throne. The temple book and the cherubim book. There's more about the temple and the cherubim in the book of Ezekiel than all other verses in the whole Bible put together. Let's go to Ezekiel 28. Why do we have an enemy? Chapter 28 of Ezekiel. The word of Yahweh came again to me, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Underline the word prince there. Do you see that prince? Get that word prince there. Word of Yahweh came again to me, saying, Son of man, say. Just underline the word say. That's all it says here. Just say to the prince of Tyre. In this manner, says the sovereign Yahweh, because your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am El, I am God. How many knew there was a being in the days of Ezekiel who was a prince in the city of Tyre who sat on a throne who declared, I am God. How many know that Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, in the last days somebody's going to come and sit on the throne in the church and claim, I'm God. Now, he doesn't give you anything without giving you something to understand it with. In the mouth of two or more witnesses, let my word be established. So we're building a Bible study on scriptural witnessing here. Because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am El, I sit in the seat of Elohim, in the middle of the seas, yet you are man and not El. Somebody said to me the other day, what's the difference between El and Elohim? El is Hebrew for God in the singular. El, singular. Elohim is plural. Him in Hebrew is a plural. It's like we have S in English. They got Him in Hebrew. Okay? That's plural. That's all it means. El, singular. Elohim, plural. Okay, so it's the same word, same word, just singular, one singular form, one's plural form. Because your heart is lifted up, you have said, I am El, I sit in the seat of Elohim, in the middle of the seas, yet you are man and not El, 
Though you did set your heart as the heart of Elohim, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is hidden from you. By the wisdom and by your understanding, you have gotten for yourself riches and have put gold and silver into your treasures. By your great wisdom and by your trade, have you increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. How many know you cannot serve Elohim and mammon? Special form of mammon. It's the same word used for Rockefeller today. The inner core of the Illuminati. The inner core of the world bankers, the one-worlders, who also claim that they are God. Therefore, thus says the sovereign Yahweh, because you have set your heart as the heart of Elohim, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and they shall defile your brightness, and they shall bring you down to the pit, and you shall die the death of them that are slain in the heart of the seas. Will you yet say before him that slays you, I am Elohim? But you are man and not El in the hand of him that wounds you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken, it says the sovereign Yahweh. Verse 11, second message. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, verse 12, son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Now, did you notice in verse 2, it's the prince of Tyre? Notice that? And all it says is, say to the prince. But it says, take up a lamentation unto the king. Now, a prince was not a king. Prince is not a king. I'm going to say that again. A prince is not a king. It's two different messages to two different people. You've got a lot of people in the church today saying these are both one and the same people, both getting the same message. I'm sorry, there's two different messages to two different folks. Archaeologists, in working in Babylon, uncovering the ancient archives, have uncovered that in Ezekiel's day, There was a prince of Tyre, and he was, in his day, called the prince, what we today would call a king. But in those days, they were called princes. Tyre didn't have a king. Isn't that interesting? There's no record of a king in Tyre in ancient archaeology. There's no king ever known. The highest ruler of the land was a prince. But there's somebody who's working behind this prince, and I'm going to recommend a candidate, and I'm going to say that the king of Tyre. Now, how many know that in the Bible it says that uh, Yahweh is king? But it says that Satan is the prince of this world. He's not its king. Now, Father never said, I'm going to make you princes. He said, I'm going to make you king. Let that sink in, folks. Let it sink. The highest position that Satan has as a prince, you're a king. You'll understand a little more as we begin to break this down. Son of man, take up a lamentation. The word lamentation here means a funeral song. How many know that a, a lamentation is what you is a song of wail over somebody who's died? Father's saying, I'm going to give you a song, Ezekiel, that I want you to sing at this boy's funeral. <laughs> How many know the devil's got a funeral coming and we're going to celebrate it? Oh, hallelujah. Take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, In this manner, says the sovereign Yahweh, you sealed up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Now, full of wisdom, that's inside. Perfect in beauty, that's outside. I wish I had time to break each one of these things down in the Hebrew. I do not. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. He was. Now, the prince of Tyre was never in Eden. And there was no king of Tyre in that day, so evidently this must be now the spiritual authorities that's over the physical authorities that cause things to happen in the natural. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. How many knew that Father had a garden? By the way, how many know that a garden is a special set-apart place on a, or a section of a total piece of property? There's no piece of property that's a total garden. Any of you ever had a garden in your house, in your home? You know, you put a little, you take, in order to have a garden, you isolate a little section. You separate it. The word garden literally means that which separates. That which separates. Genesis 2.8 says that Yahweh Elohim planted a garden, planted a separation in Eden, to the east of Eden. It wasn't all of Eden, it was to the east. There was a garden. It was a separate position. You were in the area called Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering. Now, 
There's only ten stones mentioned here, and I ask this question for years of Father. Why are there only ten stones here? And yet, only in two other scriptures are twelve stones listed. One, there's, how many know there's twelve stones listed for the breastplate of the high priest? And there's twelve stones listed in Revelation 21 for the New Jerusalem city. The only two places in Bible where there's a list of twelve stones. There's a list of ten, and these ten stones, by the way, are within and contained within those other two. Two are left out. This fella had all ten of them. They were his covering. Now, the mercy seat in Hebrew literally means a covering. Okay? The mercy seat means a covering. When we go into Yom Kippur, we've got some heavy stuff to give you during the feast of Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is, is called the day of covering. Kippur is the Hebrew word for covering, where we get our word for mercy. Hallelujah. The precious stones were your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. The workmanship of your tabers and of your pipes was in you in the day that you were created. They were prepared. Please notice verse 14, if you would, please. Verse 14. You were. How many know that were is past tense? You were the what? Anointed cherub. You were the anointed cherub that covers. Boy, not heavy. Whoever this king is, he was an anointed cherub. Now, cherub means guardian of the throne, participator in the holy of holies. Now on earth. No man but the high priest could enter, and then only once a year, and that was during the Feast of Yom Kippur. The only time it was on a feast day that only one man could approach wearing specific garments, and that not without blood. And our high priest entered in once and for all, fulfilling not only Passover, but fulfilling Yom Kippur. By the way, the date for Yom Kippur turns out to be the date of the sixth feast. Man was on the sixth day, and man was put out of the garden on a specific date, and the very date he fell is the very date that he must be redeemed. So Adam left the garden on the feast of Yom Kippur. He lost his covering. Here's another fellow lost his covering. He was the anointed cherub to cover. Now, the word anointed comes from the word in English, we call it Messiah. In Hebrew, Mashiach means to rub with oil, to rub down with oil. The only time you applied the oil was when you had an office, the office of a prophet, the, prophet of a, the office of a priest, and the office of a king. The only time you used the anointing oil to anoint. You couldn't be a king without an anointing. You couldn't be a priest without an anointing. So here is Father's original priest king. And he was in his own specific garden. This, by the way, was not the Garden of Eden that Adam was in. How many knew there was more than one Garden of Eden? How many knew that? One of you. Half of you. That's right. There's not the same Eden. Even Bible scholars will tell you there was more than one Eden. The Eden that Adam was in was vegetable. The Eden this fellow was in was full of precious stones. It was a different economy, different structure. How many know that when there was a Garden of Eden that Adam was in, how many know that the devil was already there before Adam fell? When did the devil fall? How many knew there was a time when he, there was no fall? I mean, you think it's because he, he, he's an angel, he's a spirit, he just kind of floats around nowhere having nothing to do? Before there was ever any sin in any realm, Father had a holy of holies. He told Moses, make everything exactly like that which is. And when this whole thing is done, you go, the last two chapters in the book of Revelation, it's the way it's in and up, folks, right back to the temple, right back to the garden, right back to the trees of life, right back to the flow of the river, right back to restoration. It's all going back. Redeemed. How many know the word redeemed means to repurchase? To restore means to put back. So in order to put it back, it must have one time been. Let that sink in. You were the anointed cherub that covers, and I set you so, so that you were upon the holy mountain of Elohim. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created, till unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, they filled the middle of you with violence, and you have sinned. Therefore, have I cast you as profane out of the mountain of Elohim, 
And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the middle of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. And I have cast you to the ground. I have laid you before kings. They may behold you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your traffic, you have profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore have I brought forth a fire from the middle of you. It has devoured you, and I have turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. All they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You have become a terror, and you shall never more have any being. Now there you have the complete history beginning and end of a person called Lucifer, which you will find also in the book of Ezekiel, or book of Isaiah, chapter 14. His name was Lucifer, which means light bearer. And Christ comes along and says, I'm the light. Now, Lucifer was a special creation of Yeshua. How many knew that Yeshua existed before Adam and Eve? How many know that Yeshua is eternal? Jehovah Witnesses say he was created. He was the first creation. Taking a word that in Greek... Hebrew has no meaning to the word creation. It has to do with creation, but doesn't, doesn't imply that he is that. He is the eternal. In the beginning was the Word. When there was a beginning, the beginning of anything. Word was already here, folks. Christ was that Word. The Word was made flesh. Christ himself, according to Colossians 1.16, made everything there is and everyone there is. Who made Lucifer? Yeshua did. And he made him to be the highest office in all of the creation and put him right into the cherubic office, anointed him with oil, prophet, priest, king, operating in the Holy of Holies, and was given dominion over a multitude of races upon this planet somewhere in Genesis 1.1. Verse 2 of Genesis 1 is a judgment statement. You can find this in Hebrew, very strong. The earth had become void. Whereas in Jeremiah 4.23, it says that he never made anything void. It's a judgment word. It's what happens only because of sin. Lucifer had fallen and took one-third of the angels with him. But what was he doing before he fell? What was his calling? He was called a cherub. Now, what I'm getting at, folks, is why do we have spiritual warfare? Why do we have a devil? Let me make a suggestion to you before I break it down. Let me just kind of lay it on you gently and then try to explain it a little better so you understand why we have an enemy and why you've got to be very careful how you live. If the devil... How many know that if, if you've ever had something once and lost it, that's, that's worse than if you never had it? I mean, if you were poor all your life, never owned a thing, it wouldn't bother you. But if you, if you were real rich and then became real poor, it would eat at you. Lucifer was failed. He was kicked out. And it's one thing to be kicked out, but he found out that the Adam people, Adam race, was made for one purpose. Take his place. Now, he had all of those things in glory, and he lost them. And all of a sudden, he found out there was somebody that was going to take his place. Oh, yeah. Because, see, he was covered with the breastplate as a high priest, and now here comes Aaron, the high priest, wearing them, and it would just tear him up. And in Christ, our high priest, wearing these 12 jewels. Now, the reason there was 10 jewels given to Lucifer before he fell and 12 given to Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood, was because in the Luciferian priesthood, how many know that the whole New Age movement is a Luciferian priesthood? They all have a priesthood. You can't be a witch without it being a practicing witch, a priest. Any, anything you practice in the New Age is, is a priesthood. Blood sacrifices, the whole thing, folks. Luciferian. And they're into stones. Now, but so were we. See, as Christians, they say, well, if I don't want to have any association with that. Folks, we had it first. They're an imitation. Ten is the number for responsibility because that's why you have ten commandments. In other words, all of your responsibilities can be compounded in ten. You have ten toes, you've got ten fingers, because whatever you can do, you do it through tenness. It is ordinal responsibility. Twelve is the number for government or authority. All of a sudden, he was not given governmental authority. He was placed under governmental authority, but he had 100% total responsibility authority. And there's a difference. Ten stones. Now, let's see if we can make some sense of some of this. All of a sudden, we become cherubs. We become king priests. We become molded into the life of Christ. And through Christ, I am going to be made to rule this world. And I'm going to be placed in a position where Lucifer used to be. He cannot handle it. And so he's got to destroy anybody that attempts 
to achieve that calling. And so when you are anointed and filled with the Holy Spirit, hear me now, when we were on the Feast of Pentecost, we explained to you that the pouring out of the Spirit was the anointing of the office of priest upon the body of Christ. Every believer that comes into the body of Christ is a priest. You are born priest. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the outpouring of the anointed. And you are now an anointed priest. But not until you are an anointed prophet, anointed priest, an anointed king, can you ever enter into the cherubic office because the cherubic office is the ultimate office of all three simultaneously in one person. How many know that Christ was a teacher? He's called rabbi, teacher. How many know he was called a pastor? He's the great shepherd. He was the greatest evangelist that ever was. He was also known as a prophet. He was also called our high priest apostle. All five ministry gifts were in him complete. And every Christian has a calling within him to be a servant, deacon, deaconess, to be an elder, to be many things in the Word. And most ministries, if you're a teacher, you're very seldom an evangelist, but you can be a teaching evangelist. Sometimes they'll merge. You'll find two offices working in one. Very rare will you ever find all five offices upon one person. Now, they were upon Christ. They can happen. You'll find the Apostle Paul was all five also. You'll find there were times when the Apostle Paul acted in the office of a prophet, he was an apostle, he was also a pastor, he was also a teacher, and he was also an evangelist. And you'll find that most of the apostles operated all five ministry gifts. Until you understand the operation of the fivefold ministry gifts. And let me tell you something, folks. There's a lot of garbage going around today about people calling themselves an apostle. An apostle doesn't mean one has been sent with a special message, and because I have a special message, therefore I am an apostle. When Paul was given the ministry of apostleship, he literally had the burden of the entire body of Christ in his heart. He was not denominational minded. Today we can't get most apostles out of their little denomination. Most prophets today can't prophesy outside of the realm of poverty or sickness. But they were national prophets. They could tell you things that were going on in other nations. Priest kings, Melchizedek's. Well, folks, let me tell you something. When you're in the body of Christ, there's a DNA code that's placed within you waiting for you to respond to overcome in your particular trial. You're born a priest, and through your priestly activities, you can become a king. That's one who rules themselves. If you can learn to rule yourself, rule your passions, rule your thoughts, rule your tongue. I mean, you know, it says in James chapter 3, verse 2, he that can hold his tongue is a perfect man. How many of you are able to just put nails into your tongues? I'm not going to say it. Oh, I want you so bad. But most of us, whatever we're thinking, we've got to tell it. Don't tell you what. Say it right out. So I haven't got control of my tongue. See, I'm a person who can control. Make sure that you don't say anything that hurts. You don't say anything that destroys. You can't even turn on a religious broadcast anymore without hearing destructive things coming over. Attacking the body of Christ. Attacking one another. Taking rumors and making them facts. Fifty percent of the garbage you hear about some pastor isn't even true. But we'll, we love to believe bad news. Isn't that right? We just love to hear about a pastor that falls. How do you know he fell? Not as many fall as you think. I bet some of you have even had people tell rumors on you that weren't even true. How do you feel when people believe things that aren't true? I've had a lot of lies told on me. They're not even true. I know I was there. They told lies on Yeshua. Can you overcome when you, through priestly activity, walking daily into your holy place, your holy place is your mind. The lampstand is your thinking faculties. Lit by the Word and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Until you bring every thought under obedience to the Word. That's the lampstand. Until you so feed on Christ and feed off of the body of Christ in ministry of servanthood, you become the manna, the altar of incense, your intercessory prayer. And when you take your soul life and you begin to do priestly activity, you have a right to eventually pull back that veil of misunderstanding and enter into the realm of the Spirit and become a king as you worship the King of Kings and sit with Him on His throne, which is the right of every believer who is an overcomer. But to those who get there and stay there and maintain their rulership, 
Father is going to take them from all cultures, from all nations, from all people, and these are His cherubims of glory. They are the ones that are going to destroy all of the works of the devil on this planet. And it will be done on the day of Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur has not been fulfilled yet, folks. It's been fulfilled in Christ. It's not been fulfilled in the body of Christ. And it will be fulfilled before the end of this century. If you, if the church does not receive its glorified body, by the day of Yom Kippur, you have another year to go. This earth is going to be cleaned up and restored back on the same date that Adam was put out of the garden. We're going back into the garden. And we're going to clean up this earth. And then you're going to see the rain of the King of Kings over this whole planet. It's going to be glorious, folks. But it's all right here in types and shadows and past histories and examples. Now, to break it down, how much time do I have? I haven't seen anything. Do we have? I don't know whether i got five minutes or five hours. That's it, huh? How do I put another hour's worth into ten minutes? Well, I'll try. Let's go to the book of Judges. And I, since I don't have time, I can't read it all, but I just want to give you a, a glimpse of something here. You need to go home tonight and read the book of Judges, chapter 7 and chapter 8, very carefully. There's a story of Gideon. Gideon has reached a place in his life where he is one of the judges. He's one of the rulers over the nation of Israel at a time in Israel's history when it was downtrodden by the enemy because of their own rebellion and sin. Gideon had acquired an army and a following of about 30,000 soldiers, Israelite soldiers. And there was trouble coming from the Midianites. Two of them were princes. It's interesting that every name in your Bible has a meaning. Let's take a look at it. Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, who was Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And Yahweh said to Gideon, I'm going to jump down to uh, verse 24, Judges 7, 24. I'll give you the story. He had 30,000 people. You always said there's too many people because if you take 30,000 people against those people down there, it'll be such a snap that they're going to think that Yahweh wasn't with you. You just did it on your own power, your own strength. You know, sometimes Father is not going to let you achieve something on your own, lest you say, I did it myself. And it's going to cost you to become a disciple, folks. It's going to cost you some pride. It's going to cost you some ego. It's going to cost you a little humiliation. If you humble yourself, He'll exalt you. So don't worry about it. So he said, what I want you to do is I want you to put this statement out to all of the, the fighters. Anybody here that has any fear, go home. 20,000 went home. <laughs> he had 30,000. That means two-thirds just from natural fear. Now, it's, is, is there anything wrong with uh, being afraid to be a soldier? I mean, you know, it's, it's got it. I don't know of any soldier that isn't at normal fear. To, you know, I mean, anytime you're out there in the class, you don't know who your enemy is. You've never seen him. You, you don't know what he might pull on you. And we, we know that death is a real thing in a war. But Yahweh said to him, he says, I want you to tell everybody that has any fear, go home. 20,000 went home. Now, I don't know if that meant 10,000 of them didn't have any fear, but anyway, it implies it. Then he said, you still got too many. What I want you to do is I want you to take those 10,000, go down to the river, and I want you to watch how people drink water. Turn 10,000 people loose that haven't had a drink in about three days. And let's see how they drink water. Now, knowing most of us, if we've been denied certain things that are normal things and luxuries in life, of, of what we call necessities, all of a sudden it's there. You know, there's a tendency just to go, you ever been on the desert, spent the whole day in a desert, you know, and there's no water? You get real hot, real thirsty, real fast. And all of a sudden, if you saw a pool, there's a, there's a natural flesh tendency to just go, dressed or not dressed right in the pool, right? Just like you are. Father said, I'll tell you how to find out those that I've chosen and those that chose themselves. Watch how they drink. If you're a soldier, how many know that the war is never over till the war is over? He said, those that will drink water in spite of how thirsty they are with their eyes looking around and will cautiously, slowly drink water but letting their eyes be above their thirst, let them choose. But to those who plunge in, reject them. 9,700 jumped in. 300 out of 30,000. Now, what do you think the percentages are? What, what is 300 out of 30,000? Anybody know, was that one out of every hundred or one out of every thousand, isn't it? One of a thousand. Now, that's a low percentage, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's not a very good percentage rate. Now, these were all Israelites, all redeemed, 
all under the covenant, all circumcised Sabbath keepers, <laughs> holy namers. <laughs> oh, I hope some of you get this. <laughs> 30,000 of them fighting for Yahweh and 300 made it. The rest were all sent home. Didn't know why. These 300 were given a task and they did it. And they went down upon the Midian army and father caused such a victory that they didn't even have to fight. The enemy turned on itself, killed itself. How many of you would like to see demons just kill themselves instead of killing you? There's, okay, there's, there's a way to fight spiritually, folks. Now, I want you to get what happens here. In verse 24, And Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian and take before them the waters as far as Bethbara, even the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were gathered together, and he took the waters as far as Bethbara, even the Jordan, and they took the two princes... Now, notice that word prince again. They took the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. Oreb and Zeb. Now, these were the princes, okay? These were the princes of Midian, what we would call today mayors. Now, I'd like to take Meyer, Mayor, uh, Mayor, to be Mayor Feinstein, Governor, rather, I should say, Governor Feinstein. Put, put her with Oreb and Zeb. Those that have spiritual ears to hear what I said, it wasn't speaking physically. She hates Christianity, folks. She's already made the decision to destroy us. She can legally. They took the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. And they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon beyond the Jordan. Now, as you go down a little bit further into chapter 8, notice verse 5, chapter 8, verse 5. And he said to the men of Sukkot, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread to the people to follow me, for they are faint. And I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. Zeba and Zalmunna. These are the kings of Midian. Now notice again, we got the same thing that we had in Ezekiel. Do you see that? There were princes and there were kings. Now, Oreb in Hebrew means the raven. How many know that the raven is a blackbird? It refers to corruption. Zeb means in Hebrew the wolf. Therefore, refers to ferociousness, fierceness. A wolf will just tear up its prey. These two leaders were corrupt and they were ferocious. Would you say that about a lot of people in this world today? The, the leaders are corrupt and they're ferocious. And Father's looking for some Gideonites to do battle against them. Yes. But they finally got a hold of the head corrupter and the head destroyer. And they killed them. But they hadn't yet got to the king. The kings got away. The king's name was Zeba and Zalmunna. Again, if there were two princes, there are two kings. Now, the word raven is opposed to the dove. How many know what the dove is in the Bible? Holy Spirit, isn't it? Purity. Purity. Now, folks, you're either going to you're either going to be, in your life, there's going to be a purifying factor or you're going to be giving in to a corrupting factor. And there's a spirit of corruption. There is leaven. Leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of Herod. And it will corrupt you unless you stay very close to the dove. Okay? But notice there's only one person who overcame the wolf and that was the lamb. Got that so far? Just mentioning that. The king of Midian, Zeba, means... Zeba actually goes along with Zeb. Because his name in Hebrew means a slaughter made in sacrifice. He doesn't mind killing people. He doesn't mind destroying. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to destroy. He is a destroyer. And we have to kill him, the source of all things. The unseen power behind people. Zalmunna in Hebrew means a forbidden shadow or a spiritual death shade or ruler of darkness, the occult. So what you have here is princes representing evil and governing people, and kings are that which is behind the prince and dominate them. These are qualities of fallen human nature. Now get what I say, because what I'm about to say is a heavy revelation, folks. We all have, by the fall, certain characteristics to our flesh life that is corrupting. Natural, fallen characteristics of flesh. But spiritual wickedness can only operate through me if they can control my weaknesses. 
So the war is whether I can give up my weakness to the Father before Satan can use me through the weakness. Now, everybody here has got a weakness. There's no human being made that doesn't have weakness in their life. You say, hey, there's something wrong with me. Even a shrink can't solve my problem. That's what salvation is all about, folks. Your worst is nothing to the Savior, and it is through the priesthood that it is corrected and removed from the operation of the dove ministry. The king has no ability to operate corruption through me if I do not allow my thinking to accept corrupting thoughts. So there's a war within me that closes the door. Satan hates the fact that I'm taking his position. But folks, let me tell you something. I have to become a king or I will be ruled by a king. There is no such thing as no kings. You either kill the kings or they'll kill you. And the only person who legitimately has a right to kill a king is a king. King of kings. Making us kings. You know why he's going to make you a king? So you can learn to rule. You're to be the governing force behind this world. We're taking over that dominion and that territory. That's what I believe is what we find in Ezekiel 28. Let's take a little bit closer. The word cherub. In Hebrew, as we said before, which meant guardians of the throne, the word cherub in its, in its root, meaning in Hebrew means to cut. Cherub, to cut, to engrave. We get the engraving that's upon a coin from that word cherub. Literally means the office of a representative. Office of representation. I represent Father down here. I'm a representative. I represent my Father. Now, you're either going to represent yourself or you're going to represent Father during the course of your day. To those people who can say, at this point, I'm going to speak only what Father would have me say because I am His representative, or I ignore Father right now because I'm not in church, and I'll speak what I want to say. You have a choice. And there's going to be a selection, folks. And some of you can just stay priests until Yeshua comes, and some of you are going to be made kings. You're going to be chosen for the battle to destroy kings. Did you get what I said? You're going to be chosen for the battle to destroy kings... If you can learn how, to first of all, destroy the king's rule over you through your inherited weaknesses. To those who can control themselves, Father is going to give the rule of kingship to this world. To those who overcome, all of you have a, your problem is not mine. It's not fair, therefore, you look at me and say, well, you've got the worst problem. Therefore, I ain't worried about mine. There's a lot of Christians who sit there and point the fault finger at everybody else's you know, every one of us can see everybody else's faults. It's just that I can't see my own, right? Now, you notice that most Christians don't tell other Christians what they see. They tell the other Christians what they see about you. They don't tell you what they see wrong. They tell other Christians what they see. Did you hear about someone? You know what? I found out about them. We love to tear down when the Bible said, if you have ought against your brother, go to him. Now, who needs to go to the Father about me? I do. Well, what if I got a problem with you? I need to go to you. What if you don't hear me? Then I go back to Father. But I don't go to everybody else in the church. And I don't go to the newspapers. If you see your brother fall, Galatians 6, one, kick him. Doesn't say that, does it? All right. Do I still have a few minutes left? i got one scripture we got to give and I haven't given it yet. Two minutes? That's terrible. Psalms 89. Psalms 89. you got to get this, folks. Psalms 89, verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Where is the throne? The mercy seat. The cherubim were made out of the mercy seat. How many cherubs? Two. One on each side. What are the foundations of the throne? Righteousness and justice. A cherub is one who defends righteousness. Now get this. If you are to punish the just, or give mercy to the guilty. You have destroyed the throne of Yahweh. That's the only way you can destroy the throne. If Lucifer was the original cherub, what was his 